Uncertainty often triggers anxiety and speculation. How do we view and respond to times of uncertainty without panic? The book of Revelation provides a lens to see our present day in light of what is to come. No matter what has happened or will happen, King Jesus always has the last word. We're so glad you're here this morning. Let me say a quick word to our college students because I know many of you have finals this week and then you will be scattered into the wind going home and visiting family and going on trips. And so we just want to say to you how much you mean to us here. I know sometimes as you come to the campus ministry and as you come and sit in your pew here at church, you think, well, no one would miss me if we're gone. That's not true. We would miss you. We do miss you when you're not here. And so thank you for your commitment to our campus ministry. Thank you to your com for your commitment to being here and worshiping with this church family. We really want to be your home away from home. And so thanks for letting us do that. And we wish you all the best this week, those of you who have finals. For everyone else, we're always glad to see you. It's always good to be together, and especially as we think about the reason that brings us together, and that is our common faith. And if you don't have a faith in Jesus, but you find yourself here today, I am especially thankful that you are here. And I hope and pray that you'll be open to what God has for you today, and not just today, but in the days to come. Don't resist the urge of the Spirit of God working in your life. If you have a Bible, you might open it up to the very end of your Bible. If you're somewhat new to the Bible, just keep turning until you get almost to the end. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. We are finishing up our series on Revelation today. This is the last message in this series, and I hope that this series has been informative. I hope it's been good for you. I hope that Revelation has in some ways become more accessible to you. Sometimes Revelation is one of those books in the Bible, we know it's there, but we sort of avoid it. Because once we start reading it, we get so confused and there's so much going on. And I hope through this series, at least, it's become a little bit more accessible to you. More than that, I hope that the message of Revelation, the recurring message of reassurance, I hope that it has and will continue to resonate with you. That Jesus does, in fact, win that all of this we're going through, that ultimately life will be redeemed, that Jesus will be victorious, every knee will bow before him, and we want to share in that victory, which means we want to be with Jesus. Not just someday, but right now. We want to be with Jesus right now. And I hope you won't forget that, that message, that important message of revelation. It is a message of reassurance and hope. I'm sure you've probably seen that classic movie, Field of Dreams. I think it's from 1990, 1989. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but I, I think that's about the time it came out. Classic movie. Um, and then there's a, there's a memorable scene in this movie. And of course, the whole movie asked the viewer to sort of put disbelief on the shelf for a while. Just suspend disbelief and, and let your mind go to these places it takes you because it explores some really important themes relationships, regrets, life after death. And in this memorable scene, Ray Kinsella, who is played by Kevin Costner, meets his dad, John, who has been dead for quite some time. And he meets him, of course, and of all places, a baseball field that Ray has built in his backyard right in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa. And as his father emerges from the cornfields and walks toward his son, and you sense this, this heavy moment, this moment of, of being reunited, the father, John, looks around. And he's sort of taking it all in. He notices the sunset and the smell of the grass. And he says, it is beautiful here. He says, can I ask you a question? Is this heaven? <laughs> and then... The Kevin Costner character gives us that famous line, it's Iowa. It's Iowa. And his father says, well, it, I could have sworn it's heaven. And so that prompts then the question by his son, Ray. He says, hey, is there a heaven? Is there a heaven? And his father says, well, yes. Yes, there's a heaven. It is the place where all your dreams come true. Is there a heaven? 
and what is it like? Aren't those two of the questions that we most ponder? Aren't those two of the questions that virtually every person, if you live long enough, you wrestle with? What happens after we die? Is there a heaven? And if there is, what is it going to be like? Are we going to be floating on clouds? What, you know, what is it going to be like? And I, I'm not here to tell you that heaven is going to be like Iowa. <laughs> and I don't know if all of your dreams are going to come true. I guess it really depends on what your dreams are. But I can tell you this, the last two chapters in your Bible answer those two questions. Is there a heaven? And what is it going to be like? So it's so important that we not stop short of finishing this series, that we look at the final two chapters in your Bible. And throughout Revelation, especially here toward the end, we have Jesus basically ushering John through this gallery of images, seeing one image after the other, these vivid, very detailed, descriptive scenes that are unfolding in this divine revelation almost like a series of paintings, or if you put these scenes together, it's like a movie playing out that Jesus is showing John. And we've already seen that these scenes, as they come into focus, we are seeing not necessarily what happens at the end of life, we're seeing what happens at the beginning of life as it is intended. Life with God. And so in one of these scenes, Jesus has come back riding this white horse. He's bringing justice and judgment. In another of these scenes, we see what that judgment and justice looks like, at least for the beast and the false prophet and the dragon who is Satan, who is behind the beast and the false prophet, the evil empire, pagan empire, Roman empire, which, if it's not Rome, it's another earthly pagan kingdom. And we see what happens to these entities. They are cast away forever and ever. Chapter 20, verse 10. Satan is finally silenced. His influence is ended. He and his minions, minions he and his envoys, are put away forever and ever. So what does that leave? What does that leave in heaven? What is heaven like? Well, we have the answer to that question. We're going to start in chapter 21, verse 1. We just read a moment ago. We're going to read that again. Let it sink in. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so what do we have? We have Jesus saying, I am bringing a new reality, a new heaven and a new earth being fused together into this new reality where we will dwell with God. Sometimes it's, it's easy to see what something is when you talk about what it is not. And so throughout these two chapters, we have several things that will not be in heaven. And by looking at these things that will not be in heaven, we gain a better understanding of what will be in heaven. So first of all, he says, there will be no sea. No sea. Well, if you're a surfer, I'm sorry. Can you surf in heaven? I don't know. There won't be a sea. Again, this, this isn't literal necessarily, okay? Where, what was the sea? Why is that significant? Do you remember what emerged from the sea earlier in Revelation? The beast, this earthly, pagan, powerful aspect of the Roman Empire, the beast emerged from the sea. For first century people, the sea was a place of darkness and mystery. It was known as chaos. And so what is he saying here? In the new home that we have, there won't be chaos. 
There won't be a place of, of darkness from which earthly, pagan, powerful influences emerge. There will be no sea. He goes on to say there will be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. He says these belong to the old order of things, and that has passed away. These things that are conditions of humanity in a fallen world, we can put those aside. Think about that for a moment. Imagine having no reason to cry, no reason to be sad, no reason to mourn or grieve. There will be no funerals. There will be no graveside services. There will be no hospital waiting rooms or doctors coming out with a prognosis that doesn't look good. There will be no death. No reason to cry. He says there will be no temple. In chapter 21, verse 22, no temple. Remember, the temple was the place where people encountered the holy God. They would make their sacrifices. The priest would go into the holy of holies on the behalf of the people and make these sacrifices. In essence, it is where God met his people. And now there won't be a need for a temple because God will dwell among us and we will be with God. He says there'll be no sun or moon. Again, for first century people, sun and moon, they, those were sources of light. He says in heaven, in our new home, they will not be sources of light. They won't be there because any light we need, in fact, anything we need, will come from the Father and from the Lamb. He goes on to say no night. There will be no night there. Sin is hidden in the darkness of night. Fear comes from what might be lurking in the night. There will be no night in our new home. Nothing to fear. In fact, he goes on to say, there will be nothing impure, nothing shameful, nothing deceitful. In God's perfect recreation, these things will not be there. There's no place for imperfection. There's no place for impurity. All will be made pure by the precious blood of the Lamb. And there will be no curse. The curse from Genesis chapter 3, it will be lifted, granting freedom and joy to humanity and to the restored earth. Are you starting to get a glimpse of what our new home will be like. And again, it's difficult because many of these things are symbols, aren't they? Many of these things are word pictures to get us to understand what it's going to be like, the essence of our new home. Basically, what he's saying is all the things that limit us, all the things that burden us, all the things that epitomize the human condition in a fallen world will be gone. God is truly making everything new. The old order of things has passed away. The way things are in our upside-down, mixed-up world. You ever feel that way? This world is just mixed up. It's just messed up. The way things are in this upside-down, mixed-up world will finally be put right-side up. We sometimes think that Things are as they should be now. We look around and things are chaotic, but we think that's the way the world works, and I better learn how the world works if I want to be successful in the world. And I understand that, but the truth is, this world is not our home. Things are not as they should be. One day they will be as they should be. Words visual descriptions, they really don't do justice to what heaven is. But it's all we have. And that's what we're given in the text. And so two metaphors are used to describe what's going to happen, to describe our new home. The bride of Christ, which is a common theme throughout the New Testament, and the holy city, Jerusalem. These two metaphors are used. The bride, the wife of the Lamb, is obviously the church, as we read earlier, dressed in fine linen, which the text says are the righteous deeds of God's people. And the bride awaits life with the bridegroom, which of course is Jesus. Finally, the two will live together, will be together. 
You know, at weddings, sometimes things don't go as planned, right? I mean, most of us who are married probably have stories about things at our wedding that didn't go exactly like we wanted them to. Or maybe you've been to a wedding and you've seen some things just go sideways. You know, bridesmaids don't always remember their rings. Grooms don't always remember their vows. Groomsmen sometimes pass out. Cakes sometimes fall over. There's, there's just things that happen. And I, when I'm doing a wedding, I always tell the couple, just be ready. I know you're going to plan. I know you're going to have everybody in the right place. You're going to give reminders to everyone, and you think everything is going to be perfect, but something will go wrong. Trust me. At one of my sister's weddings, which, one of my sisters, it was, she only had one wedding, but her, at my sister's wedding, let me get that right. At my sister's wedding, I have two sisters at her wedding. The minister kept calling her the other sister's name in the wedding. Yeah. So now we give my other sister a hard time about being married to my brother-in-law. It's a mess. <laughs> Sometimes things go wrong in weddings. And yet one day there will be this wedding, this beautiful wedding, this perfect wedding when everything will be as it should be. But even at our weddings, that's not the most important thing, right? That the cake is there, that everyone's standing in the right spot, that every word is said correctly. That's not the most important thing. What is the most important thing at a wedding? That there is love being shared, that there is life being shared, that two are coming together to join in what God has done and is doing. And that's what we await on the great wedding day and we will finally live with the Lord forever. The second metaphor here is the holy city of Jerusalem. Look at chapter 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And so we have this holy city, Jerusalem, descending down from heaven. And John sees specific aspects of the city that represent the old covenant, the 12 tribes, and the new covenant, the 12 apostles. Everything is being done in its fullness. Everything is happening in the culmination of God's plan and purpose. We have this holy city descending from heaven. And a part of our minds think about that literally. I mean, we envision like this big city floating down from the sky. And we think that it's actually Jerusalem that is so important. And of course, for first century Jews, for first century Christians even, Jerusalem was such a central part of their faith and life and society. If you stand right now on the eastern slope of the old city Jerusalem, in the Kindron Valley, right off the, the Mount of Olives, you will see hundreds, maybe thousands of white graves there on the slope. For generations, for centuries, people have been buried there because they feel like the Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem, that he's going to establish Jerusalem, and they want a short commute. <laughs> they want to be right there. And you can still be buried there, but it's going to cost you about fifty or $60,000 or more. Spaces are getting more and more limited because it's so crowded. I think our, our, our minds just go to the literal. That's how we're wired. We think about a literal city. When Jesus talks about this holy city coming down, I don't think it's restricted by Google Maps. I don't think it's a pinpoint on a, on a globe. He's using this as a description of something that is central to God and to God's people. In fact, when John, when we continue in John looks at this image remember the gallery and he sees this image actually you know the, he's taken up on a mountain and he sees this he sees the dimensions of the city it is massive 
1,400 to 1,500 miles long. Same distance, miles wide. In fact, the same distance, miles high. You say, well, that's a, that's a perfect cube. And it is. Which is supposed to make us think about what? The Holy of Holies. Which was also a perfect cube. About 30 feet wide, 30 feet long, 30 feet high. You see what he's doing here? These first century Jews knew that the Holy of Holies was where they encountered a holy God. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the high priest went on their behalf. That is where God was. And now, basically, the Holy of Holies is descending upon us. It's massive, which means God is going to be among us. We will live with God. We will be with God. Remember verse 3 of chapter 21. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Life as God always intended it. You see, he began it at Eden, didn't he? In the garden, dwelling with humankind. And then what happened with the Old Testament the tabernacle, the temple. What were those structures about? About people encountering God, about God dwelling with his people. And then he validated at the incarnation. What is the incarnation? That is when Jesus walked among us, when the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And ultimately, that's what God is going to do, what he has planned to do, what he's been moving toward all along, dwelling with his people for all of eternity. We will be with him and he with us. So we have a wedding. We have a new home. We have a garden. All echoes of creation and features of God's new creation. You see, back in Genesis, Adam and Eve were joined together by God. You might say there was a wedding in Genesis. And they were given a home, the garden, Eden. And God dwelt with them. God was with them and among them. And in that garden was the tree of life, the very place where freedom gave way to pride and sin entered the world. And then suddenly the earth was cursed. But in God's new creation, the curse from Eden is what? It's lifted. The garden is restored. More than restored, it is renewed in a different form. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light." and they will reign forever and ever. There's that phrase again. We read it in chapter 20, verse 10, talking about the dragon, Satan, who was put away forever and ever. And now he says that those who serve God, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, will do what? They will live forever and ever. Heaven won't be us floating around on clouds. Heaven, I don't think, will be like Iowa, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't think heaven will be a perpetual church service as sometimes we think, maybe when we're young. It won't be boring. It won't be monotonous. It will be life-giving and life-sharing as we finally live as God intended, with him and for him, enjoying the fruit of his provision drinking the water of the river of life in his presence. Life will finally be as it should be, lived in the light of God's love, far removed from any darkness, 
All the things that weigh us down here, all the worries, all the struggles, all the suffering will be gone. I recently came across the origin of the word nostalgia. We think about nostalgia as looking back to the good old days or thinking about a different time and and wanting to go back and revisit those things. It's interesting, that word, when it was first coined in 1688, actually referred to a sickness, a disease. (laughs) The word was coined by a Swiss physician, Johann Hofer. In his medical dissertation, he formed this word from two Greek words. The Greek word nostis, which means homecoming, and algos, which means pain. So in essence, nostalgia originally was this pain or this longing to go home. In fact, many Swiss soldiers were diagnosed with nostalgia, this this disease, because they didn't want to be away from home on duty. They wanted to be at home. And it it got to the point where soldiers would hear this very specific Swiss song and it would increase their feelings of nostalgia. And so they outlawed that song. Anybody who played that song could be punished by death even. That's how serious this was. Nostalgia. Christians should be diagnosed with nostalgia. Not a longing to go back to to some other time, the good old days, because remember, what you think are the good old days weren't probably good for everyone. This place is not our home. Why would we long for a place that isn't home? You see, our nostalgia, our pain, our longing to go home should be for our true home, our heavenly home. That is the greatest desire of our heart. And so we carry around this tension of living in this world right now, this life, but knowing this isn't home. Sometimes we forget that, though. Sometimes we get so caught up in the things of this world, the things of this life, that we forget about our true home. But let me ask you, are you living in full anticipation of heaven? Are you longing to go home? Do you have a pain within you that says, I don't belong here, this isn't my home. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to serve while I'm here. I'm going to allow God to work in and through me because much needs to be done here as we help bring heaven to earth. But ultimately, this isn't home. I think when you lose loved ones, people who are close to you, heaven becomes more real, doesn't it? Sometimes as you experience certain things in life or as you get older, your longing for home becomes stronger, doesn't it? Are you living with full anticipation of heaven? Are you longing for your true home? away from this upside-down, inside-out world where pain plagues us and evil pursues us constantly. You know, it'll happen sooner than you think. Chapter 22, verse 12, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Jesus says, this is going to happen soon. Now wait, Jesus, are you talking about The evil Roman Empire will fall soon? Are you talking about you're going to come back and bring judgment soon? Well, both apply, don't they? The Roman Empire fell. As powerful as it was, it fell. And to a God who sees a day like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, Jesus will come soon. The question is, are you ready? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You say, well, where do I sign that book, right? (laughs) Like when you go to a wedding or a funeral and they have the book out there, just show me the book and I'm going to sign it. See, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to wonder, is my name written there? God gives you freedom to choose whether or not you want your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Who's the Lamb? That is Jesus. Have you allowed Jesus to wash your sins away? Have you claimed him as Lord of your life? Have you been baptized into Christ and claimed a faith of your own? He wants to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. Do you remember what it said earlier? His servants 
will live forever and ever. We've called this series The Last Word because Revelation is obviously the last book in the Bible, but also because no matter what happens in this life, and certainly for these first century Christians who were facing intense persecution, life was difficult. But no matter what happens in life, Jesus has the final word. He has the last word. And so now we conclude with literally the last words in your Bible. Chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. I have to wonder if I live my life with that phrase, those words on the tip of my tongue, come Lord Jesus, deliver us, rescue us, return to us, take us home. Do I live my life with those words on the tip of my tongue? For that to happen, they have to be rooted somewhere deeper, don't they? They have to be rooted in my heart. My greatest desire has to be to be with Jesus. My greatest desire can't be to have worldly success or earthly power or anything that this world says that we should strive for. My greatest desire has to be to be with him. Come, Lord Jesus. Is that your desire? I hope and pray it is. And I hope that you're living your life that shows that is your greatest desire. Because when that is your heart's true home, it will be evident. It'll be evident in your relationships and how you deal with stuff. It'll be evident in your choices, in your language, and how you treat people. If heaven is your heart's true home. If we can help you today, we want to, if you're ready to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, don't wait. Confess your faith that Jesus is who he said he is. Be baptized into Christ. We can make that happen today. Or if we can encourage you and pray for you, we want to do that. A couple of their shepherds, a couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor right behind me. They're going to pray. They'd love to pray with you. You can just go there in just a minute and find them there. Or you can come down to the front. You know, when we sing an invitation song, it's usually a very uh, reflective song, contemplative song. Today it's going to be different. It's going to be a celebratory song. We are going to sing when we all get to heaven. And I just ask you to sing this like you mean it. Sing it like you are looking forward to heaven. And let your face in on the news as well, okay? <laughs> Imagine one day standing face to face with your heavenly Father. I mean, think about it. In the Bible, no one got to see God's face. We just read that we will stand face to face. And we carry so much baggage and so much pain and so much sorrow around. You'll be standing before the God of the universe, your heavenly Father. And he's going to take his hand and he's going to wipe away every tear. Every tear that you have shed for your family not being as it should be every tear that you have shed for grieving the loss of people that you love dearly, every tear that you have shed for injustice in this world and in your life, every tear that you have shed over the pain and suffering that is the human condition, he will wipe it away. Because there is no pain, there is no death, there is no mourning. He is making everything new. So sing it like you mean it when we all get to heaven. Let's